Hi, my name is Nicholas Hatcher, and this lecture will be on dissociative and somatoform disorders. Let's begin by discussing dissociation. In dissociation, an individual strips an idea, object, or situation of its emotional significance and aff affective content. This functions as a defense mechanism that separates emotion from behaviors. In every dissociative disorder, a cluster of related mental events is beyond the patient's power of recall but can return spontaneously to conscious awareness. This is often a response to extreme trauma, especially experienced during childhood. Have you ever driven somewhere and once you reach your location, you've asked yourself, how did I get here? This is an example of dissociation in a mild form. Dissociative disorders include dissociative amnesia, dissociative fugue, dissociative identity disorder, and depersonalization disorder. Dissociative disorders can be explained using a variety of theoretical frameworks. Biologically, the limbic system may be impaired in individuals who experience traumatic episodes in childhood. Trauma is implicated as an inhibiting factor on one's ability to process information. There is found to be a disturbance in the cortical visual system. Physical illness such as brain tumors, epilepsy, mi and migraines may lead to symptoms indicative of depersonalization disorder. Certain drugs such as alcohol, barbiturates, benzodiazepines, and hallucinogens may cause some people to experience depersonalization symptoms. Freud explained that repression produces dissociation. Emotions or ideas that are unacceptable to the individual are pushed from awareness. Repression protects the individual from emotional pain. A dissociative reaction may be viewed as a flight from crisis or danger, a major psychological route for escape from anxiety. Behavioral theorists view dissociation as a learned behavior. Essentially, the individual learns that avoidance behavior provides protection from a painful experience. After repeated experiences, this avoidance pattern is reinforced. Humanistic theorists view the individual as a composite of life experiences, biological factors, psychological factors, and sociocultural factors, and interpersonal interactions. Amnesia is a loss or failure of memory caused by functional problems of memory areas in the brain. Dissociative amnesia can be differentiated from organic amnesia in that it differs in cause. Dissociative amnesia is caused by psychological factors rather than physical. There are two main categories of amnesia. In retrograde amnesia, there's a loss of memory for events that occurred prior to the onset of the problem. In anterograde amnesia, there's loss of memory for events that occurred after the onset of the problem. There are a variety of ways that amnesia can manifest. Localized amnesia is the most common form in which the individual forgets only specific and related pastimes, usually surrounding a disturbing event. In selective amnesia, the individual forgets events details. In generalized amnesia, the memory loss en encompasses the individual's entire life. In continuous amnesia, the individual cannot recall events up to a specific time, including the present. In systematized amnesia, there's a loss of memory for certain categories of information, such as all memories related to one's family. In dissociative fugue, the individual wanders, usually far from home, for days, weeks, or months at a time. During this period, the individual completely forgets their past life and associations. Unlike individuals with amnesia, they are unaware of having forgotten anything. When they return to consciousness, they do not remember the fugue. Theoretically, the patterns of, of dissociative amnesia are similar to those seen in conversion disorder except the individual does not avoid some unpleasant situation by getting sick. Instead, the person does so by forgetting or repressing certain traumatic events or stressors. Dissociative identity disorder is the presence of two or more distinct identities within one individual. Dissociative identity disorder originates in childhood as a result of chronic trauma. This is usually in the form of child abuse, especially sexual. In attempts to cope with the horror of reality, the child's ego splits through the dissociative process. Each trauma-induced dissociative experience shapes the development of alters. 
Chronic abuse leads to, fi to a fixation of the dissociated ego splits. Through dissociation, the child may view the abuse as if it were occurring to someone else, like in a movie. Depersonalization disorder is characterized by one or more episodes of feeling detached from oneself so that the usual sense of personal reality is temporarily lost or changed. The individual often feels mechanical. In this disorder, there's basically a fight between two different patterns. Egodystonic are feelings that are experienced that are unacceptable to the person's sense of self. In egocentonic, feelings that are experienced are in concert or congruent with the person's sense of self. In this disorder, there's intact reality testing noted, so there's no experience of hallucinations or delusions. Disturbed sensory perception and thought processes, ineffective role performance, and ineffective coping are all nursing diagnoses that apply to the patient experiencing a dissociative disorder. For disturbed sensory perception and thought processes, you can implement strategies for identifying the underlying source of anxiety aimed at recovering unconscious content, such as free association or dream description. You can also use projective psychometric tests such as Rorschach or the thematic appreciation test. You could also implement hypnosis, which assists in reintegrating the alter personalities. Administering thiopental sodium or pentothal may be beneficial in eliciting a truthful history from these patients. Supportive insight therapy with the goal of surfacing and integrating traumatic experiences in order to learn new ways of coping with future anxiety is another intervention that can be used. Talk therapy aims to desensitize traumatic memories. Music therapy promotes relaxation. Gestalt therapy gives voice to opposing feelings. For ineffective role performance, work with families in order to adjust to role performance alterations. Including family members in the therapeutic counseling relationship helps them learn new ways of dealing with the patient. Secondary gain is often associated with dissociative behavior. Some patients may use the illness to escape responsibility and obtain special treatment. Support families in avoiding reinforcing dissociative behavior. For environmental manipulation, minimize stressful aspects of the environment to assist in problem solving. You'll also want to minimize obvious stressors because the patient will learn to confront and become desensitized to underlying conflict. For ineffective coping, psychotherapy can teach the techniques of effective coping. Manipulating the environment to provide structure may be a helpful intervention. Aim to promote behavior modification and establish a supportive therapeutic alliance with the patient and their family. In somatoform disorders, also known as psychosomatic disorders, physical symptoms suggest physical disorders for which there is no evidence of organic or physiological cause. The most commonly experienced symptoms include fatigue, pain, and sensory changes. These individuals are often reared in chaotic families. The family dysfunction was usually marital discord, substance abuse, and or personality disorders. For whatever reason, the child received inadequate nurturing. Many of these patients experienced physical or sexual abuse as children. Somatoform disorders include the following. Somatization disorder, conversion disorder, pain disorder, hypochondriasis, body dysmorphic disorder, undifferentiated somatoform disorder, malingering, and factitious disorder, also known as Munchausen disorder. Somatization disorder is characterized by physical complaints that include pain, GI symptoms, sexual symptoms, or symptoms of deficit, suggesting a neurological condition. This often begins before the age of 30 and occurs over a period of years, therefore it's not acute. This disorder may result in significant impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. In conversion disorder, one or more symptoms or deficits of voluntary motor or sensory function suggest a medical condition. This always precedes conflicts or stressors. It's not intentionally produced, 
and causes significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. Psychoanalysts explain that conversion disorder is caused by repression of unconscious interpsychic conflict and conversion of anxiety into a physical symptom. There is conflict between an instinctual impulse, for instance aggression or sexuality, and the prohibitions against its expression. The symptoms allow partial expression of the forbidden wish or urge, but disguise it, so that patients can avoid consciously confronting their unacceptable impulses. Conversion disorder can also be viewed in the context of learning theory. Conversion symptoms can be seen as a piece of classically conditioned learned behaviors. The symptoms of illness learned in childhood are called forth as a means of coping with an un otherwise impossible situation. Biologically, it's thought that the cause of conversion disorder is from hypometabolism of the dominant hemisphere and hypermetabolism of the non-dominant hemisphere, and this is implicated in impaired hemispheric communication. Symptoms are thought to be due to excessive cortical arousal set off by negative feedback loops between the cerebral cortex and brainstem reticular formation. Sensory symptoms seen in this disorder include anesthesia and paresthesia to extremities. Deafness, blindness, and tunnel vision may also be seen. Motor symptoms include abnormal movements, gait disturbance, weakness, paralysis, gross rhythmic tremors, coriform movements, tics, and jerks. Symptoms often worsen when attention is called to them. Other associated features include the following. Primary gain is used by keeping internal conflicts outside awareness. For instance, the individual may feel guilty about being unable to perform a task and convert this into the expression, I would, but I have a condition. Primary gain is related to internal motivations. In secondary gain, Patients accrue tangible advantages and benefits as a result of getting sick. This allows them to get excused from obligations and difficult life situations. Secondary gain is externally motivated. In labella indifference, the individual appears unconcerned about serious symptoms. These are all things that you may see in conversion disorder. In pain disorder, You'll find pain that is severe enough to cause clinically significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning, for which psychological factors are thought to have an important role. These are often not intentionally produced. Psychoanalysts describe pain disorder as a symbolic expression of intrapsychic conflict throughout the body. Patients often suffer from alexithymia, which is the inability to articulate their internal feeling states in words. Therefore, these individuals express their feelings with their bodies. By displacing the problem onto the body, the individual may feel they have a legitimate claim to the fulfillment of their dependency needs. Behaviorally, this can be a means of manipulation and gaining advantage in interpersonal relationships for instance, to ensure devotion of family members or to stabilize a marriage. This is an example of, of secondary gain. Biologically, we know that the cerebral cortex can inhibit firing of afferent pain fibers. This mechanism is often impaired in pain disorder. We also know that increased activity of limbic regions occur in response to painful stimuli. Serotonin is most likely the main neurotransmitter in the descending inhibitory pathways and is implicated in this disorder. Endorphins also play a role in central nervous system modulation of pain. Endorphin deficiency correlates with augmentation of incoming sensory stimuli. In this disorder, the pain may be post-traumatic, neuropathic, neurologic, iatrogenic, or musculoskeletal in nature. The important thing to remember is that there must be a psychological factor that's judged to be significantly involved in the pain symptoms. It's interesting to note that major depressive disorder presents in 25 to 50 percent of these patients and dysthymic disorder or depressive disorder symptoms occur in 60 to 100 percent. Symptoms include anergia, anhedonia, decreased libido, insomnia, and irritability. 
Some believe that chronic pain is almost always a variant of depressive disorder. While acute pain serves as an adaptive mechanism executed to seek help and alert the individual to danger, chronic pain always has a psychological variable at play. In the treatment of pain disorder, it's important to discuss the issue of psychological factors early in treatment. The psychological factors are important in the cause and consequences of both physical and psychogenic pain. Explain how various brain circuits that are involved with emotions, for instance the limbic system, can influence the sensory pain pathways. Analgesic meds do not generally benefit most patients with pain disorder. SSRIs and tricyclic antidepressants are most effective in treating this disorder. Psychodynamic psychotherapy involves developing an empathetic therapeutic alliance and acknowledgement of the reality of pain for the patient. Alternative therapies include biofeedback, hypnosis, and transneuronal stimulation. Hypochondriasis is a misinterpretation of bodily symptoms that results in preoccupation with the fear of having a serious disease, despite appropriate medical evaluation with negative results. In the context of the social learning model, symptoms are viewed as a request for admission to the sick role made by a person facing seemingly insurmountable and insolvable problems. This offers an escape that allows the patient to avoid noxious obligations, to postpone unwelcome changes, and to be excused from usual duties and obligations. In the psychoanalytic perspective, Aggressive and hostile wishes towards others are transferred through repression and displacement into physical complaints. The anger of patients with this disorder originates in past dis disappointments, rejections, and losses. But the patients express their anger in the present by soliciting the help and concern of others and then rejecting them as ineffective. This is often a defense mechanism against guilt. Body dysmorphic disorder is an excessive preoccupation with an imagined defect in appearance that causes significant distress or impairment in social, occupational, or other important areas of functioning. In the psychoanalytic perspective, this is seen as reflecting the displacement of a sexual or emotional conflict onto a non-related body part. Biologically, this condition may possibly be related to serotonin because of patient responsiveness to SSRIs. In diagnosing this disorder, you'll often find compulsive behaviors such as excessive mirror checks and excessive grooming and mental acts such as comparing their appearance to that of others. The most commonly focused areas include the hair, nose, skin, eyes, head, face, and overall body build. In the treatment of this disorder, surgical, dermatological, dental, and other medical procedures to address the alleged defect is almost invariably unsuccessful. There has been some success in tricyclic antidepressants, MAOIs, and primazide, or ORAP. SSRIs have been found to reduce symptoms in 50% of patients experiencing this disorder. Psychotherapy that aims to understand the true nature of their neurotic feelings of inadequacy may be beneficial. In undifferentiated somatoform disorder, there are physical complaints of at least six months that cannot be fully explained following appropriate investigation. The symptoms are not intentionally produced and result in social or occupational impairment. Malingering occurs when a person deliberately fakes symptoms in order to benefit. Malingering is consciously motivated and usually results in secondary gain, which may be in the form of extra attention, relief from responsibilities, or financial rewards. The prevalence of malingering varies from 20 to 50 percent in patients with chronic pain who have a financial incentive. This often occurs in the following situation, personal injury and workers' compensation litigations, military service, and criminal cases. Factitious or Munchausen disorder is the intentional production or feigning of physical or psychological symptoms. The major difference between factitious disorder and malingering is that a person with factitious disorder has a psychological need to assume the sick role. Unlike malingering, external incentives for the behavior are absent. 
Uncontrollable lying is the hallmark characteristic of this disorder. Stories are fabricated in order to catch the attention of others. These individuals are often dramatic in terms used to describe symptoms, but vague about the onset and duration of problems. These individuals may also deliberately give false medical histories that may become quite elaborate. They may also use several different names and often seek treatment in several agencies to avoid detection or recognition by someone who has encountered the patient during a previous visit. Munchausen by proxy syndrome, or MBPS, is a variation of Munchausen syndrome and occurs when parents or caregivers deliberately induce signs of an illness in another person, usually their own child. This is a rare type of child abuse whereby the caregiver deliberately injures the person under their care. This is done in order to gain sympathy or attention for themselves. The individual with this syndrome has an insatiable need for attention, even though the person's behavior is harmful to others. The following nursing diagnoses apply to the patient experiencing a somatoform disorder. Impaired verbal communication, ineffective role performance, and compromised family coping, and ineffective coping. Disturbed thought processes and disturbed sensory perception is another nursing diagnosis that applies to somatoform disorders. For impaired verbal communication, assess the meaning behind the patient's communication patterns. Encourage exploration and demonstrate empathy to enhance the patient's verbal communication and self-esteem to the point where the patient feels ready to face problems. Establishing a trusting relationship is key in somatizing patients. Express respectful skepticism regarding oversimplifications and overdramatizations. The group setting provides an opportunity to receive feedback about the effects of behaviors on others. For ineffective role performance and compromised family coping, educate the family and patient about the disorder, stressing the importance of avoiding unnecessary surgical or medical procedures. Encourage independent functioning and reduce po the possibility of secondary gain by not focusing on the physical symptom. Assume a matter-of-fact, supportive attitude with the optimistic expectation that the patient will regain functional abilities in work, family, and social roles. For ineffective coping, the goal is to help the patient express their conflicts verbally rather than acting them out through symptomatic behaviors. The goal of long-term or insight therapy is to promote effective emotional expression by exploring the sources of anxiety. Supportive therapy seeks to improve self-esteem, perhaps through such measures as expanding the patient's interest in their environment. Avoid reinforcing the patient's symptoms. Ignore the symptom, but never the patient. Concentrating on the symptom gives it more importance than it merits, thus increasing the secondary gain associated with it. For disturbed thought processes and disturbed sensory perception, help the patient improve the capacity for perception and thinking by supporting general measures to reduce anxiety, such as thought stopping, reframing, and imagery. Maintain a calm, unhurried attitude towards the patient, listen carefully, and maintain an objective, undistorted view of reality. Avoid a premature challenge to the patient's symptoms and complaints. As patients gradually relinquish their defenses, propose other ways of understanding the condition such as by suggesting a psychological explanation for a physical complaint.